Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Professor Adam Tiemann of the Annex Labs at Bar-Ilan University, and today we'll be learning Lecture 10, Arithmetic Circuits. So let's start with a quick look at data paths. If we look at a modern processor, we're going to have multiple functional units. As you can see here, in this type of a processor pipeline, we're going to have all these n functional units, and n can be a big number, and the bit width of these n units can also be big. We can be dealing with, for example, 64-bit data, or even larger than that. So these things are going to be big, there's going to be lots of them, they're going to be taking up a lot of room, a lot of power, and have very complex wiring. So how are we going to make them? And the way we make them is usually called bit slice design. So here's a conceptual look at bit slice design. We have our data coming in from the left over here, and it's going to be stored in registers. And we have, for example, in, with 64 bits, we're going to have 64 uh, bits, 64 flip-flops or something like that to hold each of our operands. Okay, um, if we can stack them up like this, one on top of the other, and then pass the data so each of the bits goes horizontally through this thing in a very straight way, we can have real simple wiring and very efficient. Okay, but uh, again, this uh, processing element, it might have several things in it. It might have adders, shifters, multiplexers, it could have even multipliers and so forth. What we want to do is really make identical processing elements so each one of these bits can really traverse as much as possible in a straight way through, um, through the different uh, elements here. And so each one of these things, we want to have the same pitch, the same size and so forth. That will really simplify our build of this thing to, until it gets to the data out. And so let's see how that is done in, in actual um, practice. And we see a pretty old processor over here from 2002, but we really see this uh, bit slice design where each of these are the bit slices that are built into our integer data path over here. Okay, again, this is going to be big. It's going to be um, crunching numbers all the time and so forth. And you can see with the processor heat map that this is an area, the execution core, that's going to really heat up the, the, the hotter um, the higher the temperature, the more red we get over here versus other areas which might be a cache or something that's um, less accessed and so forth. And so it's going to be cooler. So we also want to remember that we have to design this thing to, um, to protect our energy efficiency, to get low, uh, low energy. So that being a kind of a motivation for bit slice design and so forth, which is going to help us in, in, in the next part, let's go over and remember what basic addition is all about. So if we take the just a regular way of taking an n-bit vector and uh, two n-bit vectors and summing them up, we can go to the basic like textbook serial adder concept. So the serial adder concept says that at time i, we're going to read one bit from each of the two operands. And so that would be a i and bit i. And we're going to produce a sum of those two bits and uh, a carry. Um, okay, so let's see. What we can do is we can have two shift registers, as you can see here, shift register one and shift register two. And in the first clock cycle, we're going to read the first bit out of shift register one and out of shift, shift register two. We're going to put them into a one bit adder here, which is going to go into this X and the Y input over here. We're going to get out of that the sum of the X and the Y and the carry. Okay, the sum we can store back into the shift register because we shifted one forward, okay, and the carry, we're going to store it temporarily inside this flip-flop over here, and it becomes the carry-in input of the next uh, cycle, and we can continue that n cycles, okay, so we're going to each time shift out one bit from here, one bit from here, sum them, store the sum back into the, uh, to the shift register um, over here, um, save the carry, so that becomes the third input of our, uh, our one bit adder. And that's a, a way we can in uh, n cycles, we can really um, arrive at the sum, but that's real slow. Okay, in any case, we use a, a full adder there that that basic one bit adder was a full adder. And here, let's look at the truth table of a full adder and remember what it is. So just the symbol over here has, you know, two inputs, okay, two one bit inputs, x and y, and it has the carry in input. And then it provides two outputs, which is different than most of our logic gates. Most of our logic gates, we usually have one amp output. Here we have two outputs. So it's actually a combination of two logic gates or two Boolean functions. One of them is called the sum and one of them is called the carry out. And this is a logic table. And if we go and write the, equa the equations for these uh, two um, uh, outputs, we get that the sum is just an XOR of uh, X, Y, and carry in, and the carry out is um, this uh, type of an equation. And what does this mean? Well, if we think about the sum, the sum is, is going to be that the odd number of bits is going to be the sum. So if we have, for example, um, two of the inputs are one, we're going to have the sum is going to be a zero. And if we have three or one of the bits is a sum, the answer is going to be a one. And that's exactly an XOR operation. 
Okay, the carry out, when do we get a carry? When at least two of the bits are a one. So the carry is going to check each pair of two bits, x, y, x, c, in, and y, c, in, and see if at least two of them are a one, the carry out is going to be a one. It's kind of an overflow type of a thing. Okay, and here we can see an a simple gate level implementation of this. We can have two XOR gates that get, um, you know, x, y, and carry in, and we can have three end gates, which um, are for these three uh, partial sums that go into an OR gate and provides us with carry out. Now, a lot of uh, paper has been burned on looking at these simple little equations over here, and I just want to give you some types of uh, points of view that are a bit different, and they're going to help us in the rest of this lecture and how we build actual hardware for, for doing more complex or faster type of addition and multiplication. So if we look at the first two lines of our truth table, we can see that the carry out is zero um, when we have that both x and y are zero independent of the state of carry in and that's a real interesting thing it means that if x and y are zero then we kill the carry independently of carry in we kill the carry and so we can call kill x um, bar y bar looking at the other side we get the corollary of that where if both x and y are one independent of what the state of carry in is we always get a one at carry out. So X and Y, they generate a carry out independently of the third input, which is carry in. So that we call generate and that's X, Y, okay? So what is the middle state over here? The middle state asks, what do we get for carry out, okay? If either X or Y are one, but not both of them. So one of these two are one. And the answer is pretty simple. Then the output is exactly what the carry in is. So you can see zero brings zero, one brings one, zero brings zero, and one brings one. So we're basically, if we have X and Y being uh, one of them a zero and one of them a one, we are propagating the carry in to the carry out. So we call that propagate, and it is X, uh, X or Y, which is uh, means that only one of them was a one. Okay, so those are interesting names that we gave to parts of this truth table, and we can use those types of names to just um, rewrite the, uh, the uh, equation for sum and carry. So the sum can be just now uh, propagate x, x or y, um, xored with the carry in, so propagate x or carry in, that's one way of writing the sum, and the carry out, which is maybe more interesting, can be written as generate or propagate um, times the carry in. So what does that mean? So that we get a carry out equaling to one. If we have generate, that, uh, independently of what happens with carry in, generate will always bring a one as a carry out. It's generating the, the, um, the carry out. But if not, then we have a propagate situation. Okay. And we, what do we do? We propagate times C in. So we, whatever C in is, we um, transfer to the output. So that's another way of looking at it. The C out is generate plus propagate times carry in. Okay, just another small point. We don't like XORs, and propagate is X or Y. Um, CMOS doesn't like X or much, so you can kind of write that uh, propagate is just X or Y, um, and that that covers a bigger thing, but it, it doesn't lose it doesn't lose the part of X X or Y, and it gives us an easier type of a CMOS gate to implement. Now, I just want to mention one more thing that um, this, uh, this uh, carry out, basically, it's checking if we have um, two of the inputs are one, right? If uh, both X and Y are one, or X and C in are one, or Y and C in are one. So it's asking, what is the majority state of the inputs? Are there more ones or more zeros at the input? And so this can be called a majority gate. So C out can also be called a majority gate of X, Y, or C in. And sometimes if you look at standard cell libraries, they'll provide you, for example, with a majority gate. Okay, so a full adder is therefore just a majority gate and a three input XOR. And we can build such a thing. And here you see kind of a CMOS um, uh, implementation of two gates that give us this, uh, this type of thing. And if you, um, if you count the transistors, you'll find out that there are 32 transistors that were necessarily necessary to make these two gates, this three input XOR gate and this three input majority gate. 
Okay, so we now have our full adder, and what we want to do now is we're going to build a um, an n bit adder, a larger adder, and the basic concept to do that is what is known as a ripple carry adder. Ripple being like a, a wave or something like that that moves down, um, you know, along some sort of a line or like a domino type of effect. Where and what we're going to do really is we're going to take the carry and we're going to ripple it through the adder from bit number zero until bit number thirty two or thirty one or 63 or whatever to the end of the uh, uh, of, of the adder so um, we can take it here and actually um, we have on the one side uh, uh, in in the top level we have our data going this way so we have our carry in which is going to be zero at the beginning we have our ai and bi's going into just these one bit adders so a1 b1 a2 b2 a3 b3 and a4 b4 and these together the carry and the a1 b1 into the full adder are going to provide us a sum of that stage and the carry that's going to then ripple into the next stage become the input to this and once the input comes here we can get the sum of here and produce the carry which can now ripple down to here produce the sum of this and then the carry which will ripple into here produce the sum of this and the carry and then we get our entire um, uh, vector which is going to be c out s4 s3 s2 s1 that is our answer Okay, so again, we can see it here, we have a full adder that gets A0, B0, and carry in 0. It's going to provide us a sum and a carry. We wait for the propagation delay of this. The carry is going to go out. Once the carry gets here, we can put it into the full adder um, gates along with the A1 and B1. We'll produce S1, and we'll be able to produce C out, zero, uh, C out 1, which will then, again, become the input of this full adder. It has to produce this C out 2, which will become the input of this adder. And finally, we can produce C out 3. So we rippled the carry out all along. The S0 was er much, uh, available much earlier than S1, much earlier than S2, much earlier than S3. And finally, the carry out arrived. Okay. And what does that mean? It means basically that the propagation delay of the adder has to go through a whole bunch of these carries on the order of n. n minus 1 carries uh, propagations it has to go through, plus the final sum at the end to give us really the um, the uh, propagation delay of the full adder. And that's really a lot. So the um, propagation delay through this is on the order of n, which is kind of large. Um, we want to do something better than that. And it's very clear that the carry out is uh, the critical path. Can we exploit this to improve the design? Well, let's again go back to this type of um, um, how we write the equations for the uh, uh, for the full adder, and we can see here something interesting. So the sum, which is a x or b x or c, can actually be rewritten if you really play uh, around with this Boolean algebra to be something like this. It two parts of a, an equation. One is a b c in plus a plus b plus c in times c out. Um, or C out bar. Now, why is that important? Because we can, can say we can make the sum with using the uh, the output, which uh, which usually we we conceive of it with the full adder as being together. But that means that if we can produce the C out, then we can use it as one of the inputs to the sum, and we'll see how that is uh, used to implement a full adder in a different way. And so here is the implementation that we can see. So um, uh, here is our uh, sum type of a, uh, uh, an equation, and here is the carry out type of equation. And because carry out is on our, uh, on our critical path, we want to produce our carry out, which is over here, as fast as possible. Okay, so we do that by doing AB uh, plus AC plus BC, right? And that produces our carry out um, uh, uh, bar, and then we want to use an inverter to produce carry out. So carry out is over here already ready with a uh, with a relatively uh, small gate with a relatively low logical effort and so forth. And then we can have time because sum is a much uh, you know it, it doesn't take as it doesn't need to wait for the care uh, the the carry of the previous stage to produce it. So what we can do is use this carry out. It's this stage's carry out that only has to you know uh, this stage's carry out. We can use it to produce the sum which is already using this um, kind of a b c in over here plus you know this uh, a or b or c in and c out bar c out comes into here and then we can use the inverter to provide us with our uh, with our sum so that is a, a, a um, an implementation that puts an emphasis on getting the carry to the output as fast as possible and if we um, uh, look at that it has 28 transistors uh, which is a bit 
fewer than before. Plus, we can uh, make our logical effort. So we have two things in, in series here, two things in series here, and three things in series here, and the same for the um, for the pull up. And we can get our um, uh, our sizing over here with beta equals two, and figure out the logical effort of this. And we find out that the logical effort is nine. Now that's a pretty large logical effort, but we can see something else. We can actually go and uh, change this uh, a bit around. So we have something really weird here. You see that there's A, uh, A and B, but here there's A or B. And so it means um, that we can actually do these types of things a bit um, uh, in parallel to each other and restructure um, the full adder so it's not pure CMOS according to the textbook how we learned it but if you play around with it you can get the same thing by again breaking up this A and B into one branch over here and having the other part which is A or B uh, A or B and C in the other part and this is not, again not a pure CMOS type of a gate but it actually reduced the complexity and the same thing we did over here with the two branches of the sum. Um, and this is already 24 transistors, which is a smaller implementation. There are some other uh, types of um, interesting things that we can observe here. So if we look at the different um, nodes over here, we can see that A, B, that this will be zero because of these two gates. If A and B are both one, it will pull down this. So that is actually generate. A equals one, B equals one is generate. So it's generate bar. Uh, corollarily, if both A and B are zero, which is our kill state, what happens is that this is uh, one. So kill is, uh, is is actually this you know node, okay? Because of these two uh, transistors, and these guys are just propagate. Why? Because in this case, either A or B, um, one of them is a one, right? One of them is a zero. So the pull up here up to this point is on and the pull down up to here is on so all we care about is the inversion over here what state is it, if it's one or zero so that's actually propagate inverted so it's propagate bar so that's an interesting thing to observe if we look at the structure of how um, this thing is built okay now if we size this guy right we can see over here that we're uh, we have our uh, uh, our two pull downs that are um, that are serial and uh, two pull-ups that are parallel and again over here two and two and here three and three and that's going to give us a, a, a much smaller logical effort and if we figure it out it's seven so we really were able to just change the structure here of the um, uh, of the implement the transistor level implementation and we're going to be able to get a better logical effort However, what happens if we have 64 stages or actually like, I guess, 32 stages with uh, an extra maybe stage of the uh, carry out bar over here? It's going to be something like um, four to the power of 64 to get an uh, optimal you know, path effort. And that's going to be something that's really, really huge. OK, but can we do anything better about it? Because um, that's really bad. It's going to mean that we're going to have to upsize each bit. And that's something that uh, is really bad to do, but we'll see how we can um, address that in a minute. Okay. So something that's really interesting that's often done is to exploit what is known as the inversion property. So again, this gate that we got over here, this uh, transistor level gate is very strange. It's not pure CMOS. It's actually something different. And if we look at it very closely, I mean, it's kind of hard not to see. Look, this pull down looks exactly like this pull up. This pull up looks exactly like this pull down. And again here and again here. Hmm, that's very strange. Usually we have, you know, a parallel pull up and a serial pull down or the opposite. But here they're actually built the exact same way. And that's a real interesting thing. It is an inversion property. What it means is that if we take such a gate and we give it the A, B, um, C, we get C out and sum. Because the gate is built like that, if we were actually to put a uh, inversion on each of the inputs, so we were going to put A bar, B bar, C bar into the gate, what we're going to get is S bar and C out bar. And that's a really interesting thing because now we can actually get rid of this guy by doing this. We put at the first stage, we put A uh, a, a, B, and C, we um, enter into the full adder. And what we're going to get is C out bar. Okay? We get S bar, but here we can put the inverter. It's not going to cost us in our logical effort. Okay? Now we have C out bar as our input. And we can use 
A, uh, um, A1 bar, right? We put an inverter here, an inverter here. And what, uh, what happens is we're now we're going to get um, some bar and C out. I mean, C, we're going to get C out and sum. And now we can put this as the same type of, a, of an odd stage, which is going to get A, B, uh, and C. And it's going to put sum, which we're going to invert, and C out inverted. So now we can put A inverted, B inverted, and we have our C out inverted. We're going to get C out and sum. So we can really get rid of this extra stage that's going to um, take half of our logical effort off. Okay, so if we save the inverter, our, um, our uh, path effort becomes um, 4 to the 32. Okay, for a 32 bit uh, um, for a 32 bit adder instead of 4 to the 64, which we had on the uh, in the previous state, um, and that is called a mirror adder. Okay. However, we have a big problem. How are we going to make a bit uh, a high speed bit slice layout? So the thing is that using our logical effort, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to upsize each of the stages of the uh, of of this adder, and because they become bigger and bigger, it doesn't fit our bit slides concept, which said that each and every single one of the bits has to be made identical. And the question is, can we somehow make them identical? We want to have identical bit slices so we can put them in our bit slice design and uh, bit number zero and bit number 63 are going to look exactly the same. And so is bit number 11 and bit number 14 and so forth and so on. Okay, so the question is if we can do that and also just not have the huge gates that we're going to get downstream. And the question is, let's see, can we inherently get an optimal electrical effort? Um, if we say our electrical effort, the optimal electrical effort is four. Can we design our mirror adder to get our electrical effort of four? And that's a good question. And for a first stage of how to plan this, we're going to do something really trivial. Um, everything here on this side is not on our critical path, right? Um, the only thing that's on our critical path is getting the carry out over to here. So everything not on our critical path, we can uh, size it as a minimum size inverter. So again, we do two and two, four and four, you know, and uh, all of these guys are not on our critical path. They create the sum. We can make them minimum size. That's uh, to start. All we have to worry about is sizing uh, this, this stuff over here. And let's see if we can do it so we get an electrical effort of four. And that's kind of an interesting type of a thing. So let's see if we can take this first stage, these six transistors over here, that will provide us with an electrical effort of four. Um, so you have to remember that logical effort is just a function of the gate topology. It is not a function of sizing. Okay, remember, a NAND always has a 4 over 3 logical effort. It doesn't have to do with the sizing if we have a very big NAND or a small NAND. It's just a function of the gate topology. And therefore, we can temporarily size the first gate as a minimum sized inverter just to figure out what the logical effort is. Okay, so if we have 2, 2, 2, and 4, 4, 4, we get 4 plus 2 divided by um, 3, and that gives us a logical effort of 2. So the logical effort of this stage, according to its topology, is 2. Okay, so that we know. That's not a question of, uh, uh, of how we're going to size it right now. But to get an electrical effort of 4, electrical effort is, if you remember from our, um, our stuff about logical effort, it's logical effort times the load over the input capacitance. Okay, and we know we want to get it to be four. We also know that the logical effort is two. Okay, so that means that to get an electrical effort of four, we need C, uh, the, the C load divided by the C in to be equal to two. Okay, so this is what we want to do. We want to somehow get our C load of this stage divided by the C in of this stage to become two. How are we going to achieve that? What is basically the C load of the C out so we can understand if that is going to be our uh, thing? I mean, our C in is going to be basically uh, um, derived by the size of these two transistors. But what is going to be the C load? So let's look at that. Okay, so here we have our gate that we started with. Again, we sized everything that's not on our critical path to be like a minimal sized inverter. That's the smallest we could do it without hurting our beta over two. Okay. Um, the C in, again, is what we see over here from any gate that's driving this. So it's actually the sizes of these two transistors, which is our variable that we're trying to find out. The C load of the C out is what this stage 
drives. So it's anything that we see from over here. And what do we see from over here? Well, first of all, we have these two transistors that we see over here, right? And we see that they're sized four and two, okay? But we also have the next stage, okay? So this is going to go output and drive our next stage in our mirror adder. And what's it going to be connected to? Well, okay, let's see. It's going to be connected to this input, which is actually the C in of I plus one, which we want to be actually the same as the C in of this. We want to make all of these things similarly sized and still get our electrical effort of four. So this is going to be the C in of I plus one, but also, and if we look down into here, this transistor, this transistor, this transistor, this transistor, they're also driven by um, the C in. So the C load is connected to both these two and to these four. Okay, so we can now calculate C load of C out is going to be six, which we have here, this plus this, plus the C C in, which is going to be the capacitance of these two guys together. Plus, you know, uh, here we have six and here we have nine. And so we get that it's uh, all together C C in plus 21. And now we actually have two um, types of things. We saw that we wanted CL out over CC in to be um, two. Okay, and we know that we want CLC out that it is equal to CC in plus 21. Okay, and that means that um, to get that, we, we have to have this double the size of this. We need CC in to be 21. And so we size the PMOS 14 and the NMOS 7. Okay, um, so if we get the PMOS 14 and the NMOS 7, right? And we can uh, do the same here with A and B. They don't affect our logical effort. We're going to have an electrical effort over here of four. And that is true for stage C in, stage C in plus one, stage C in plus two, and so forth. So each and every one of these is going to be exactly, all the gates are exactly um, equivalent sized. And that means we can go back to our bit slice design where we have one bit and the second bit and the third bit and so forth. They're all going to be the same size with this 14 over seven in this first stage and all of the other sizes that we chose here along the way, which don't um, affect the logical effort of our critical path. They obviously affect the logical effort of our non-critical path, but we don't care about the sum. We care only about the carry path. So a last point over here before we continue on to our faster adders is subtraction. How do we subtract two numbers? Well, we're when we usually are working in two's complement, we remember that the kind of algorithm or, or definition of two's complement means that to give it an inverted um, uh, representation of a number, it means that we first, you know, um, we uh, negate our number, so we put a, a bar on our number, and then we add one to it, okay? So that's the definition of a negative number. In other words, if we want to do A minus B, it's just like doing A plus minus B, so we can say A plus, you know, B bar plus one. So A plus B bar plus one. That is um, doing subtraction. So that's really cool. All we have to do for subtraction is make the B bar so we can take the B and invert it, okay? And add one by adding one to the C in of the entire, uh, entire adder. Instead of having the C in of the first uh, bit, B zero, we can just add one to it. So, um, how are we going to do that? We're going to put an XOR gate here. And when we get a subtract, it's going to, first of all, add uh, C in equals one. And second of all, it's going to choose to turn this inverter into a, um, uh, uh, I mean, turn this XOR gate into an inverter instead of into a buffer. So really, we used one piece of hardware. We added this single gate, basically, and we were able to make a, um, an, uh, an adder and a subtractor with the same gate. So that was all I had to say about basic addition. And in the next part of this lecture, we'll be discussing faster and cooler implementations of adders.